All right. Good morning, Doug. We are back with questions from member of members of our file. The file is a private membership group that's when people subscribe to Crisis Investing, our newsletter, they get access to this private group and they want to ask you questions. This is the best way to make that happen. So lots of cosmic questions this week. The first one, though, is if Doug knows it's his last day on Earth, what meal is on his plate? What drink is in his glass? What cigar is in his hand? Hmm. Well, I am not a foodie. I like high quality food with good ingredients that are well prepared. Am I particular to anything in particular? Well, I, this is one of the gifts of the Orient to mankind. I would perhaps choose sushi. I'm a fan of sushi. Keep it simple. I really love Thai food. And uh, a simple bowl of pod Thai suits me as well as anything else. But I'm omnivorous as long as it's quality ingredients that are well-prepared. The other two things, what would I drink and what would I smoke? Those are easier. I wouldn't have a gin or a vodka. I would have a whiskey. Which whiskey would I take? Well, I guess an expensive one, an old single malt. Although I'm not as particular about that. What I am particular about are cigars. And there's no question that, in my mind, but the best cigar in the world is a Cohiba Esplendido. So that's my answer. Okay. It's completely arbitrary, but these are all... Listen, there was a guy that I was in a deal with when I was living in Hong Kong, a guy from Chicago. And this guy was almost a parody. Of, and I grew up in Chicago. Uh, and this guy was uh, almost a parody of guys from Chicago. Uh, everything was about the bulls and the bears. And uh, he wore a white T-shirt under whatever shirt he was wearing, of so the white, right? And um, one night we took him out to a really first class Chinese restaurant where uh, Peking duck and um, beggar's chicken, and it was wonderful. And he picked at his food, wasn't crazy about it. And I swear this is the truth. He went out and found a McDonald's to have something to eat afterwards. So it's like the Romans used to say, de gustibus non disputandum est. There's no accounting for tastes. All right. Next question. At this juncture, should we fight against evil in the world at risk of being targeted or should we be hedonists or someplace between them? You know, Aristotle thought this out, actually, not that question in particular, I don't think. Uh, and he came up with the concept of the golden mean. And he was looking at courage and cowardice, for instance. And he said, well, are you courageous if you're just rash and crazy and have no disregard? Or, And the answer is you do something reasonable in between, mm. as opposed to going to an extreme. Is it a form of altruism to fight against the evil at risk of your own financial and physical freedom? Altruism. That's sacrificing yourself for another person or an idea or self-sacrifice. And I think that's, in general, a bad idea. The way I would look at it is um, you've got to be true to yourself. So can you be true to yourself if you're sacrificing yourself to something from with outside? No, you just have, the important thing is to maintain your own sense of morality and ethics. Yeah, that's the problem with altruism. It demands that you um, make a sacrifice, but making a sacrifice is almost a bad thing because it's giving up something that's of high value for something of lesser value, it seems to me. Hmm. I usually think of sacrifice as something that, that primitive people do to placate a god. That doesn't speak well of sacrifice. Hmm. I don't think you should ever make a sacrifice. Just because some philosopher, and most philosophers, are wrong about things, but they're they become popular for some reason that maybe they shouldn't have become popular for. You know, all these questions. I, I guess the first philosopher who looked at philosophy as part of the whole was actually Socrates. And one of his essential things was, if I'm wise, it's because I know that I know nothing. And uh, the older I get, it's strange, the less I really think that I know about anything. Anyway, don't make sacrifices. Right. Yeah. You have to make good trades in life, good trade-offs. So trade-offs that are always for the better value from your moral framework. 
like, if, you know, you could say it's a sacrifice to raise children. It is. You trade off things. But I don't consider, I like, it's a, I like, to me, there was zero downside with it. Like, even though there were problems, there's zero downside. It wasn't a sacrifice. So, but it's a trade off. Exactly. You're simply making a choice. And okay. making a sacrifice is generally not making a wise choice. You want to do something because you think it's the best thing to do. Okay. So next question. Uh, we recently talked about the possibility of a U.S. civil war and World War III. Could both of these happen at the same time? And if so, what would that look like? Sure, they could both happen at the same time. And one could be set off. One could set off the other. In fact, well, look at some fairly recent historical examples. China, around the time of, the, of World War II, they had a, an invasion from the Japanese. And within that context, the nationalists and the communists were fighting each other. Hmm. What a horrible situation to be in. If you escape being killed by the Japanese, then you have to decide. Or look at Yugoslavia, for that matter, during World War II. Everybody's fighting the Germans, but then you have to make a further choice between being a uh, civil war, which was eventually won by Tito. Or, 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 so it could happen. It could happen. It could happen here. If we get into a war and chaos is created by that war, society breaks down. It's, you know, most people just want a quiet and a stable life where they can gradually improve their own standing and that of their families. But you have these sociopaths that, that start wars. I think we're headed for one. Well, yeah. we're seeing it. We're we're seeing its genesis in Ukraine right now. And excuse me, I said Ukraine. Uh, I really like to. <laughs> it used to be called the Ukraine, and not long ago, but now it's called simply Ukraine. And I, I prefer to use the, the previous name for the country, the Ukraine. Well, it's like Kiev, it used to be called Kiev, K I E V. And now it's spelled in the local spelling in the Ukraine, K-Y-I-V. So look at this. I've fallen into the trend of the bad guys trying to change the language. It happens eventually. With another repetition, they get to you. Yep, they do. Okay, let's see. Next question is, this file member says, I agree with your idea about diversifying country and currency because the country we are closest to is most likely to take our assets. However, I also agree with Brent Johnson's dollar milkshake theory, which is that the U.S. will be the last currency standing. His question is, well, what should an asset allocation be in the U.S. versus outside the U.S.? And he says, we're retired U.S. citizens, have three grown kids all living in the U.S. I'm thinking of keeping a maximum income in the U.S. to convert to cheaper pesos for living expenses while out of the U.S. Um, and have a second home and valuables stored outside the U.S., equivalent to about 25% of Toys total assets. What's your take on that? It's reasonable enough insofar as most places outside of the U.S. are cheaper than the U.S., well, with some exceptions. So that 75-25 breakdown is probably reasonable. Can you define uh, exactly what the dollar milkshake theory is? Essentially, the idea is that there's, um, because there's so many dollars that are created outside of the U.S. through the euro dollar system, as I recall, in the creation of loans by banks. So not the central bank money, but the bank money that's created outside of the U.S. and contracts that are obligated in dollars, you know, based upon all these loans, that creates a substantial and sustaining demand for dollars overseas. Why do they call it a dollar milkshake, however? Um, I'm not sure why this guy, I, I don't recall where he came up with that term. Uh, I don't, yeah, it's kind of a silly term, but everyone knows it. <laughs> Yeah, apparently they do. And I've seen it floating around and I'm looking for a good definition of why is it called a dollar milkshake? I don't know if it's right or wrong. Um, your greatest danger, I think, is your own government. Foreign governments tend to treat, well, depends on how much money you have. But you know, if, if you have some assets, the foreign government recognizing that you can leave tends to treat you better and it treats its own people 
because you can pick up and go. And this is the big problem with the U.S. It's that even if you pick up and go from the U.S., you're still theoretically obligated to file your taxes every year, even if you never step set back into the country. So uh, Americans are a special situation from that point of view because the U.S. government is the only government in the world that continues to tax you regardless of where you live and whether you ever come back to the U.S. anymore. Uh, that having been said, since, you know, out of sight, out of mind, that's one reason to, to have a significant portion of your assets outside of the country. And if they're outside of the country, it's just physically harder for the U.S. government, which is the big danger for Americans anyway, to get their hands on them. So and another point I'd make is it's pretty clear that foreign exchange controls are on their way because when the going gets tough, the government's going to do something and foreign exchange controls are always part of it. They don't want capital flowing out of the country because of their own policies. If they were good, quote unquote, policies, money would be flowing into the country because it's safe and stable and free. But money flows out of the country because the, their policies are, 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 are stupid. And the way they, instead of changing their policies, they simply make it illegal for money to flow out of the country. So all these things put together, uh, get as much as you reasonably can outside of the U.S. now before foreign exchange controls are put on for all the reasons I just mentioned. Okay. All right, great. Now, normally, we, oftentimes when we do the podcast, we talk, we, you consult the Encyclopedia Britannica and kind of the news of the day. And the news of the day on June 4th, I'm sure it wasn't there, but it should have been, is that it was Killdozer Day. And for those who don't know the story, like I encourage you to Google it, look it up. But the, this question is, was the Killdozer guy a good guy standing up for his property rights against a corrupt local government? Or was he just a nutcase causing mayhem as the status depict him? Yeah, who was the killdozer guy? Because people fall down on one side or the other of whether he right, wrong, was he sane, was he crazy? I would put it into a, the context of a Clint Eastwood movie, The Outlaw Josie Wales, which is certainly one of my favorite Clint Eastwood movies. And I see The Outlaw Josie Wales as being kind of the um, archetype uh, representing what the killdozer guy was about. In other words, Josie Wales was just a farmer that wanted to be left alone, but they just wouldn't leave him alone, and he reached a breaking point. So um, was was the killdozer guy's solution optimal? Well, I guess not, but you push people far enough, anything can happen. Yeah, if you haven't seen, there's a movie, if you haven't, don't know about this guy or haven't seen this movie. I don't know, Doug, if you've seen it, I think it's called Tread. It's a documentary about him and explains the whole story of what happened. Have you seen that at all? I have not. It's good because it goes into all the details explaining the mayhem that he caused and, you know, also what pushed him over the line, you know, what his breaking points were. So it's definitely worth watching. I can understand that. Sometimes you've just had enough and you want to make a point, even yeah, if it's costly to you. Making the point is more costly than the bad things that happen as a result. So. Yeah. His, the, the subhead on the movie is desperate men do desperate things. Yeah. You, that's why you don't really want to back people into a corner. Yep. And I think someone should tell the political leadership of the U S that at this point. <laughs> they, they won't listen. They live in their own <laughs> bubble and their own silo and they really don't care. That's true. Um, okay. So maybe, in fact, maybe they want to do that. They want to, you know, it would serve their interests if some desperate men did some desperate things. That's right. They want to make an example to show others what happens when you're a desperate man that does desperate things. It doesn't end well. All right. Next question is, what do you think of the recent downgrade of Walter Block at the Mises Institute? It seems logical since he was at such extreme odds with other ANCAPs with an issue as important as war and Israel-Palestine. But at the same time, it makes me want to compare this move to the inner Ayn Rand group and their persistent removal of the inconsistent objectivists. Put another way, is Walter's reputation salvageable? 
I don't know if this is too much inside baseball for most of our listeners, but Walter Block is an absolutely brilliant economist. He's um, his analyses in the past of things have been, you know, logical, consistent. Uh, Walter and I have been pretty good personal friends for about the last forty years, so I know Walter pretty well, and we always used to get together. Uh, at the New Orleans conference every year and have dinner and hang out because he's a professor at the at Loyola University, New Orleans. So uh, I tend to fall on Walter's side of most arguments. The problem arose with, with this dust up between the Israelis and the people of Gaza. And Walter wrote a book called um, The Classical Liberal Case for Israel. I think that's the title. And uh, he sent me a copy, and I read it. And it's a very interesting analysis of Israel and the Jews in the Middle East and the whole situation. But um, the point that Walter makes with Alan Fetterman, who's also become a friend of mine, Alan's a, Alan's a hardcore Zionist, which I have problems with, but... Um, what they're basically saying is that the land is the Jew, it's the Jews' land. God gave the Jews Israel or Palestine or this area over there, and they have a right to defend it, basically. Well, actually, I thought the Bible said that the Jews came and stole it from the Canaanites that lived there before. So who are the Canaanites? Well, Sounds to me like they're the Palestinians. Anyway, this go, this this is lost in the mists of history. It, it, we're dealing with mythology. We're not dealing with actual property rights in history. And nobody can show me an actual chain of legitimate possession of a piece of land from 2,000 or 3,000 or 4,000. <laughs> Who knows how far back it goes. Uh, all this land is basically stolen or one group has stolen it from the others consistently. So the, the argument that, that Walter's making is that Israel are the, are the good guys. Yes, in a way, the Israelis are the good guys, because at least they represent Western civilization. Okay. And, they're, uh, and, and, and the Muslims don't. I mean, Islam is a, a cult, in my opinion, that's antithetical to Western civilization. So on the one hand, yeah, I'm for the Israelis and against the Palestinians for that reason. But what the Israelis are doing in Gaza, they want to root out Hamas. But then again, it seems that most of the Gazans actively support Hamas, having voted them in and still supporting them. Uh, should you kill them all? I mean, there's no answer to this question of who owns the land, actually. Uh, it's estimated, somebody made this estimate anyway, that about 7% of the land area of Israel was legitimately purchased from a previous owner that was there. And this all started with the Aliyahs um, about 100 years ago, where, um, who was it? that Where somebody, I forgot the name of this particular guy, got the idea that Jews ought to move back to Israel or Palestine at the time from Europe, and they did. But some of them bought land. This is, this is such a dog's breakfast, this whole situation, that the only thing we can do, and I speak as we, being Westerners in general, or Americans in particular, is just leave them alone. Uh, anyway, I've gone off on a tangent here, haven't I? Walter, yeah, but... for, some, for some reason, has has come down on the Zionist side of this. I kind of, and I think, you know, when he, basically, you know, libertarian view, ANCAP view is definitely not for war. Like that's, I think that's the dividing line that really pushed him over, you know, maybe the, the division at Mises is that he's justifying, he's found justifications for this total war really that seems to be um, being um, acted upon the Gazans. Yeah, I mean, what should the Israelis have done about some criminals having come across the border 
and killed a bunch of people. What's the proper response to that? Um, well, ideally, the proper response would be perhaps what the Israelis did when some, were they Palestinians or were they just Muslims? Anyway, when they killed a bunch of Israeli athletes in Munich hmm. about 40 years ago, what they did was they treated it as a common law crime and they tracked down the individuals that did it, as opposed to launching some generalized war over the area that they came from. That, that seems to me what they should have done. But instead, they're launching wholesale artillery barrages and bombing raids on an area of land which has a lot of civilians in it. So it's a mistake. Yeah. And, yeah, and, a and what should the Americans or the West do? Not our problem. You don't want to get involved in a war between the Hatfields and the McCoys. Well, who was right, the Hatfields or the McCoys? Well, I don't know, and I don't care, and let them fight it out, but not my problem. I don't want to get involved in it. And that's the way Walter should be treating this. But the fact that he's a Jew apparently supersedes being logical and having ANCAP values. Maybe it's because blood is thicker than water. I don't know. Hmm. But okay. It's definitely Walter's caused quite wrong. a controversy. Walter's just wrong in this. He's... He's, um, you know, being of Jewish background and descent, in this case, is more important to him than, than being a philosophical ANCAP. Look, I'm on, a, I'm on a Zoom call a couple times a month with a bunch of people who are all, they're almost all rich Jews. In fact, I'm about the only non-Jew on the call. And how do these guys feel about Israel? They all support Israel dogmatically and strongly. So Walter's making, Walter's gotten sucked in and he's making a mistake. He's got to, got to, what's more important, being loyal to Jews or being loyal to your personal philosophy? And he's dropped the ball. But I still love him. I'm just sorry I'm not going to New Orleans this year so I can actually talk to him and find out. Talking with Walter is like talking to a Talmudic scholar, actually. I mean, Walter's the kind of guy that you ask him how many angels can dance on the head of a pen, and he can do that drill as well as anybody I've ever met, trying to answer that question, an unanswerable question, incidentally. Hmm. Okay. All right. Uh, what odds, Doug, Doug, do you think that uh, there, that Trump's conviction uh, in New York will be overturned on appeal? And what do you see as the likely uh, knock-on effects if they manage to make the conviction stick? Well, my mind is not wired to think legalist, but I did listen to a presentation that Alan Dershowitz made on this, and um, he thinks what's probably, not putting words in his mouth, but he thinks what's probably going to happen is that Trump will get a, the judge, this fellow merchant, will sentence him, but suspend the sentence. And that's kind of threading between the horns of the dilemma. I think that's what Dershowitz, who is very reasonable, very rational, and has great knowledge and great experience, thinks will actually happen. There are a number of other possibilities, but they don't want to touch off a civil war. So what um, Dershowitz thinks, and I think Dershowitz is right, is that Trump, since he's been convicted, what will the sentence be? And the sentence is likely to be whatever it is, something a couple of years in prison, but suspended or some other legal threading of the needle. And then it probably would be overturned on appeal from everything I've heard based upon the yes, merits of the case. that's what Dershowitz thinks too. It'll, it, that it'll be a turn, overturned on appeal. So the judge would make a point by sentencing him, but suspending the sentence mm -hmm. and that it's overturned on appeal because it's, it's banana republic stuff where you have one of the candidates put in jail on a triviality. We're not talking about you know, being accused of murdering thousands of people, which is what happens in real banana republics when the president goes on trial. So this is all a sham. Yeah, it's amazing some of the yeah. pushback we got when we talked about this last week after it happened. I mean, some people were like, you know, I'm a libertarian and libertarians believe in the law. And he was convicted by a jury of his peers. And how dare you suggest well, that it was a sham trial? Don't, don't, 
libertarians don't believe in a whole lot of laws, frankly. I mean, if you if you're a libertarian living in the Soviet Union, does that mean you have to believe in the Soviet law? No, you don't. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Uh, we hear a great deal about how China is going to launch some sort of EMP or other physical attack against, attack against the U.S. My logic says that if you want to take over a country that has resources, farmland, and infrastructure, why would you destroy that asset physically? Simply be patient and strategic, and you will eventually own the country. But what are your thoughts? Well, I think that's quite correct. So if the Chinese wanted to start a war using an EMP might be the best way to do it. But wait a minute, why would they want to start a war? Uh, if it's true that the Chinese really do think the way Sun Tzu thinks, the best war is one that you win without fighting. I mean, that's the whole essence of Sun Tzu, best war. The best way to win a war is by means other than fighting the war. And it's pretty clear that the U.S. is going into collapse for all kinds of reasons internally, financially, economically, politically. Uh, the military is falling apart. The last thing you want to do is provoke what would turn into a nuclear war where you're going to be badly damaged as well as ba badly damaging the prize you want to take. So they should just they should follow the dictate when your enemy, who, who was it that said this? Was it Napoleon? Well, some famous general. When your enemy is making a mistake, don't stop him. Just let things evolve. And exactly. that's that's what they should do at this point. Well, and it seems like that's what they've been doing this whole time. And but it gets the in the US media, this talk about how China's gonna engage in these aggressive actions, whether it be directly against the US or against Taiwan. I mean, they're like held up as this giant threat. And um it just what's what would they gain by trying to take Taiwan by force, for instance, what do they gain by doing that? I can't see what they gain because they would, there would be a huge amount of damage and a lot of deaths of people that are needed. It makes no sense. It, it's one thing to uh, put on a show and be threatening and keep things on edge for whatever reasons they have for doing that. Maybe to distract the Chinese populace with a make-believe foreign enemy. But just let things evolve in the U.S. You, you don't want to start World War III. It would serve absolutely no useful purpose. But then we get back to what the Europeans are doing in, in the Ukraine, which yeah. is incredibly dangerous and incredibly stupid and, and might wind well, up I, in World I, War III. I think, I think we're already in it. And I think just like um, I think the U.S. was trying to bait Russia into something and still seems to be trying to bait bait them into something, into something wider. I think that the U.S. is trying to do the same with the Chinese, get them to do to overreact in some way that gives them justification for war, which is foolish. It really, but... makes, it really makes no sense because the U.S. does not have a military that can conquer either of them at this point, it seems to me. All they, can and they do... seem to be doing the same thing in Korea, trying to bait North Korea into something, you know, flying, you know, live fire bombing drills right on the border with uh, North Korea. Why? It really is crazy. It seems like the only thing that the U.S. has, which will probably work, are lots of nuclear missiles launched by B-52s in the form of cruise missiles or land-based Titans, or mainly, most importantly, ballistic missiles launched by submarines. So why do they want to start a nuclear war? You it's think like they that don't even, understand? Even Schwab Klaus and his pals must realize that if the war, especially if the war starts when they're having their annual meeting in Davos, they're all gonna they're all going to return to a crisp. It, it really is strange. It is. Okay. Um, a question for Doug is he understands that you're you have this the seven high ground novels that you've been writing with John Hunt. Three are already published. And it, but it isn't your top priority at the moment. And he says, I wonder why and whether he could be persuaded because I found them an excellent gateway to a libertarian mindset. Espousing a philosophy through a novel is so much more immersive than from a pulpit. I think that's why Ayn Rand's ideas were so effective. It makes it easier to have a conversation with my daughter about these topics, for example. What can we do to get Doug to sharpen his pencil on this topic? Yeah, I, I think the observation is quite correct. It's better to show than to tell. 
and novels show how these things work as opposed to standing on a pulpit and telling, which is what you do in nonfiction. So quite a correct comment. And thank you for the compliment about the first three novels. And the uh, next four have been thought out and we know what's going to happen. But the way that John and I have, because we're co-authoring these things, the way we've broken down the division of labor is that I kind of worked out the overall plot line from beginning to end. And John is filling in the details, if you would, building a Christmas tree, and then I hang the ornaments on the Christmas tree. So the ball's in John's court at this point, and you can't push an artist to create artwork. So on the other hand, on the book that you and I are doing about what a young man should do instead of going to college, I'm the weak link. John's the weak link there. I'm the weak link here. So um, <laughs> we're going to get there. We're going to get there. Both, both of these are going to be published, I think, this year. I think John's making progress on, on the fourth book, right? Yeah, he's made threats. Yes, I think he's moving in that direction. So my reasonable expectation is that the uh, next book of the Charles Knight series, which, um, which will be called Terrorist, which is a pretty topical title for the moment, and I've certainly got lots of views on terrorism, should be out within a year. And I think that, I hope that's also going to be true about uh, the book we're doing together. What, what are we going to call the book? Uh, well, the, the working title, I think, is The Preparation. But originally it was Renaissance Man. We haven't quite settled on it yet. Yeah. Or maybe we solve it by using, lengthening the title, The Preparation. How to become a Renaissance Man and not waste four years of time and hundreds of thousands of dollars by going to college. Kind of a long title, but that would be an accurate yeah. description. Yeah, that'd be good, actually. Put them together makes sense. Okay. Um, next question. Has Doug ever been to India, and what does he think of it? It's a big, empty spot on my map. I've been to 155 countries, most of them several or even numerous times, but not India. like to go. Maybe I'll... Maybe I, I'm, I'm, I think I'm going to give a um, speech in Kuala Lumpur at the end of September, and I'm thinking about thinking about popping by India just to say, well, I've been there. But it's a subcontinent with 1.6 billion people, or they don't really know how many there are, I guess, but it's about that number. So just having gotten my passport stamped and put boots on the ground doesn't really count. But yeah. I'll have to show up. I actually, when it comes to India, I just like to listen to our friend Giant Bhandari talk about it. It's very informative. And I have to say, though, listening to him has made me uh, less interested in going, to be honest. Yeah, actually, uh, I feel the same way. So we probably ought to have Giant. Uh, we've had him on. We, we have had Yeah, him we've had Giant. him on before. We should probably have him come back, though. Yeah, see if his opinions have evolved or, or mellowed. I don't think they have. Probably I don't see that happening. I don't see them mellowing. Um, okay, next question is, does Doug think the reason the West wants Putin gone is so that it could get better access to its resources and its proximity to China? This is a mystery to me. Why would anybody want Putin gone? If I was a Martian landing here on planet Earth and looking at the world leaders, I would say, this man seems more knowledgeable, more thoughtful, more reasonable, better educated than just about any leader in the West at this point. So that's not a reason to hate him. He's not like Stalin killing millions of people or, or Hitler uh, ranting like a monomaniac, which he basically was. So why does everybody hate Putin? This is... I mean, I'm just speaking as an individual. It's a mystery to me. And what has Putin done? I mean, he's basically been in charge of Russia since the Soviet Union fell uh, 30 years ago. And yeah, he's kept the place from turning into total chaos. It's rebuilt it. I mean, look, the income tax in Russia, they raised it recently because of the war. But I think the maximum tax bracket was only... 13%. And I don't even think they have a value-added tax there in Russia. I may stand to be corrected. 
But unlike uh, the free world, almost all of Europe has a like typically a 20% value added tax, 50% income tax, loads of regulations. I mean, you, you can make an argument that Russia is actually, if you're living there, one of the freer countries. Yes, I know there's problems with the oligarchs, all this type of thing. But so why do these people want to destroy Russia? It, it's actually a mystery to me. I, I haven't heard a good argument the way you might have made about the Soviet Union, which was a danger. So what do you think? What am I missing here? I mean, my, the only thing I can think is that, well, I saw an interview, I've seen several of them with uh, Jeffrey Sachs, who apparently was there at the fall of the Soviet Union, and um, he was on Tucker recently. And he talks about the idea that the U.S. is, the idea of carving up the resources that Russia has, That's there's some advantage in that. And you've, I've heard even, was it Estonia's president coming out and saying that's what should happen, is that Russia should be broken apart and carved up? Recently, she said this. Um, so I think maybe there's part of that from a resource standpoint, but I think that, I really think it's a larger geopolitical thing where the U.S. sees China is the um, is the great threat to its hegemony. And if China has a strong Russia ally, that it makes it much more difficult to compete with China. And so by by weakening Russia, then it is a part of a strategy that would make it possible for the U.S. to somehow, in their minds, triumph over China, you know, removing their hegemony. Yeah, that makes sense. Interesting about what the Estonian lady said, Russia should be broken up. Well, most of Russia is autonomous regions, quote unquote, and the Federated Republics. They have all kinds of different classifications and lots of parts of Russia, like for instance, Chechnya, a perfect example, really don't belong in Russia from any point of view. There were conquests from 100, 200 years ago and it's still part of it. So yeah, and the colors of the map on the wall are gonna be running in Russia, just as they are in most of the world in the future. But is that a reason to poke the bear and perhaps cause a, a nuclear war? It's it's absolutely crazy. I mean, it, I just, it, 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 makes, it makes me wonder about the, you know, the, the psychological state of the presidents of, or the rulers of Finland and Sweden and Lithuania, Estonia, Latvia, Poland. They're right there. Do they really want to put themselves on the front line of World War III when Russia is actually not harming anybody? It, it really isn't. Well, who's it harming? I mean, it's, it's trying to straighten out this revanchist problem in the Ukraine. But why are these other people, why do they hate Russia and, and Putin at this point? Yeah. I mean, is there a good reason? Can somebody give me a, a good reason why these th this man and this country must be destroyed? I know that there's a lot of deep-seated anti-Russia vibes within the Baltic countries in particular, you know, just growing up, you know, alongside the Soviet Union and that there's a lot of like that anti-Russia sentiment there. So I think that you can stir that pot pretty easily to make people be reflexively, you know, anti-Russia, but it wouldn't happen if the U.S. weren't behind it all, I don't think. And, no. you know, and supporting it all where I think that the U.S., they think the what Estonia say these bad things about Russia, would they be organizing themselves, volunteering some of their military, to, tiny military, but to go support it? If if uh, the U.S. weren't there, there's no chance. Yeah, no chance. Actually, the most dangerous entity on the face of the planet today lives in Washington, D.C. It's the U.S. government. I think that's clear. And I think the rest of the world is waking up to it because one of the big things uh, about the BRICS you know, you can, we talked before that you didn't think that them creating a currency would work because they're all, there are different opposing interests. But I think what, who did I, I can't remember who, who I heard say this, but what it, the BRICS alliance is really a set of countries that have turned on the U.S. that have said, we don't like what you're doing. And so, and that the numbers of those countries is growing fast with Thailand recently, you know, saying that they wanted to be part of it. And I think that, so you just see people are waking up to the fact that the U.S. is the most dangerous. And they're trying to align their interests for the future. It makes sense. And they can see that Western Europe is imploding on itself. And so is the U.S. 
So they're trying to separate themselves from it. It's it's and it seems like the U.S. is thinking, well, we can blame our problems on Russia, and maybe everything will be better if we have a war and make a who the hell knows what's going on. We're dealing in in the realm of abnormal psychology now. The politicians that hang out with each other in Europe and the U.S. and NATO, for that matter. Yeah, it's it's turned into another hysteria. I think. Yeah, it has. Um, let's see. So next question is, what's your assessment of the situation in Niger? The legacy media never follows through with anything, so it's hard to know what's happening there. But what's your assessment? That's a, that's a good observation because they don't follow through. And it's not just Niger. It's all these countries in the Sahel. Uh, so what is happening with these things? I guess they all of them want to get rid of the French who have exploited them as best they can. They've got their own problems, though, because all of those countries, we're talking about Chad and Niger and Mali and actually Mauritania, too, they're all divided in half in the north of all those countries. I'm generalizing. You have the Arabs, and in the south, you have the blacks. And they don't really get along with each other, and the Arabs lord it over the blacks. In fact, I spent a week in Mauritania uh, a few years ago, and although they'd only abolished slavery, it was the last country on the face of the earth, Mauritania, incidentally, to actually formally abolish slavery in the law. And they did that in, I think it was 1985. But it was pretty obvious just from wandering around and meeting people and all that, that a lot of the blacks there they weren't officially slaves, but in point of fact, things were no different than they were formerly slaves. So they've got that going on. And where that's going to end, I don't really know. But they don't want they don't want the white man, which is to say the French and the Americans with their like their air base. They don't want it there, want them there lording it over them. And this is, seems like it's becoming a potential battleground for World War III, just like Africa was, you know, a battleground in World War I and World War II, because the Russians are, you know, taking the place in a way of the French and the Americans, and at least Niger. As I understand it, some Russians have moved on to what is the American base there, while the Americans are still there. Yeah, I guess it's okay. Come on in, Russians. We, we're more happy having white men that we can control fighting against the white men that have traditionally screwed things up for us. It's what a dog's breakfast it is. And none of these countries produce anything. I mean, this is the other thing. I mean, what do they produce? Well, at most, they have some land that Westerners come in and turn into a mine and produce uranium or uh, other minerals. But what else do these countries produce? They're net importers of food. They're basically importers of foreign money to, to buy their votes in the United Nations, something which ought to be abolished. It's um, it's really crazy. Hmm. All right. But next question, if a person has what they think is an invention, which has a great chance of making a lot of money, where should they go to find someone who could be trusted and would help fund creation and distribution for a split in the profits? Hmm. Well, the first thing we have to check is the premise, an invention that's going to make us all zillionaires. Uh, actually, I've run into lots of those inventions over the years, and I don't know of one that I've personally seen that has ever worked. They've all turned into science projects and money pits, uh, not good things, incidentally. So your premise that you have something that's going to be the uh, best thing since sliced bread may be unsound. And... The way this is done is you can raise money from your family or your friends. Uh, and if they won't give you money because they know you and probably the project best, uh, maybe you're making a mistake. I mean, I don't know, maybe. But uh, don't people go to GoFundMe and people just send you money if you ask for it? How does that work? That is that does. A Yep. If you got an interesting project or Kickstarter was a popular one before where people would make, you know, they'd show what they were going to make and then they would get 
basically people would support the project and buy an advanced copy of it, essentially, even before pre-production, essentially. So yeah, people do that. So I can never understand those models where they get a lot of people to send them money for some idea, which may or may not be a cockamamie idea. And what's in it for the people that are financing it and sending the money? They get a thank you or they get the right to buy it. I mean, Usually what they get is they get a the first version of the product. So they're paying for the product essentially in advance. And they and it might be if they like the project, you know, you might you're paying more than you might otherwise pay, you know, when it if it becomes a consumer product that sells in a large scale. But you like the you like it, you want to see it successful, and you'd like to have that product yourself. So you're essentially prepaying for it. I don't know. It doesn't sound like a good idea to me. I mean, because they're not going to have any ownership in the company yeah. that makes the product. It's basically making a gift to a guy who's got a possibly harebrained idea. Of course. It's true, but the, the only reason it's that way is because securities law doesn't allow them to make people shareholders easily. So their only way of crowdfunding money is having to sell a product. Yeah. As usual, the, the state is the fly in the ointment. Because if we lived in a truly free market society, anybody with an idea could form a corporation and sell shares to whoever they want on whatever basis they want. But you can't do that today or you'll go to jail. So you will. So, so just a thought I had on this. I mean, the best way, if you have, um, he was talking about this, how do you get a partner in it? Um, I read a biography recently of Rudolf Diesel, who was the inventor of the diesel engine. And, um, you know, he, he basically found people who in industry who would benefit as customers of this product and was financed by them. So, you know, oftentimes if you can't get it from your friends or your family, and those aren't the best sources anyway, the best source is the future customer. And the GoFundMe thing does it that way by going to the masses and trying to, you know, market it to customers that way. But if it's especially, but if you have a, a product or service that you want to, that you want to come to fruition and you're looking for uh, funders in it, finding a customer who could clearly benefit from it is probably the best way to make it come to fruition. That makes a lot of sense. And that means that you'll have to knock on a few doors and convince the person that it's in their interest to give you money on some business-like basis to make it so. Yep. And if you can't sell that customer on the technology or the solution, then you know for you know early on before you put in lots of time and money that whether or not your invention or your business idea is really valuable to the customer. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Um, what allocation should you one have between commodities, cash, et cetera? And also, do you think treasuries at this time are a good investment? Well, I don't think treasuries are a good investment at this point. We don't really know because the reporting is so inaccurate, so sketchy, it's so politically driven. We don't really don't know what the general retail level of inflation is. I mean, what do they say it is right now? What do they uh, say? They say it's about 5%? No, I think it's lower than that. I think it's down in the threes officially, hmm. or maybe four. Well, that runs counter to my experience, but the experience of any one of well, any of us as individuals is too selective. I mean, we don't buy all the things in the economy. So, three point four percent is what it says. Well, I don't think that makes any sense. Oh, simply because they're creating money by the trillions. Um, so, no, that doesn't make any sense. So, what should you do? It's not buy treasuries because you have the unsecured, when you buy treasuries, uh, you have the unsecured liability of a manifestly bankrupt government. And, and you're not being compensated for the risk of a security of that nature. So forget about that. And commodities really in terms of everything else, even though they've gone up a lot in the last few years, uh, are still historically, from a historical point of view, very cheap. So, yes, you want to buy commodities. How, how do you do that? There must be some ETFs for commodities in general, although I don't own any, own any of them. There's ETFs yeah. for everything. There was a, I think it's DBS is the all commodity in, in, um, ETF. I believe, yeah. Sorry, I'm trying to look it up while 
talking here, but and my internet is slow. But yeah, DBS, I think it's called. Well, that might be a good place to park capital while you're waiting for something else to happen. I like the idea of just buying gold and silver. I mean, that's really money in its most basic form, and it will be money in day-to-day -day use at some point in the not-too-distant future. I know that's an outrageous thing to say, but I think it's inevitable that it happens. But I, I don't think that owning treasuries, other than as a short-term speculation, hoping that you guess right on the actual rate of retail price rises and the direction of interest rates, uh, I don't think that's the best way to play it. Okay. And then in general, do you think that, I mean, what about holding cash right now? Cash, not in the form of hundred dollar bills, that kind of physical cash. No, I think they mean just money sitting in a broker bank or brokerage account. Well, dry powder. Dry powder. Well, it's a diversification, but don't have too much there because you're probably in real terms. At the moment, and it could get worse at any time, you're probably losing about 5% of purchasing power per year in real terms, just leaving money at, in T-bills right now. I'm guessing wildly because who knows what the real numbers are. Yeah. I just want to correct. I, the actual ticker for it is DBC, which is Invesco Commodity Index Tracking Fund ETF. It's DBC. Mm. Yeah, I guess the answer is you ought to own something like that. You ought to own a whole bunch of gold and silver, and you certainly ought to own some US dollars in cash and T-bills. And you're definitely gonna be losing 5% per year, but people say, well, you, you can say, it's probably better to lose 5% a year than take a chance on losing 50% overnight if you put your money into a, a common stock ETF, for instance, yeah. or buy Nvidia. Yeah. And Bitcoin also, right? You'd put that as something to have as a hedge at least, right? I would, as a hedge. I mean, I have no strong opinions at these levels as to the direction of Bitcoin. I think it's going higher. But okay. uh, All right. Do you know about Howard Gardner's theory of intelligence, that it's not just a single intelligence that can be measured by a one IQ test, but multiple intelligences? Well, I don't know that individual, but... It's pretty clear to me that you've got physical intelligence, that ability. What is intelligence? We have to define that word. It's, I think a good definition of intelligence might be the ability to solve problems. Hmm. I guess there are other uh, definitions, but I think that's a usable one. So uh, you take the you take an IQ test. Well, right, you can solve mathematical problems and logical problems if you can solve physical problems, like how to get a basketball from your hand into the hoop. That's a type of physical intelligence in point of fact, mechanical intelligence, emotional intelligence, the ability to deal with other people. So there are undoubtedly several types of intelligence. Yeah, I just looked it up. He lists eight. They are linguistic intelligence, logical yes. mathematical intelligence, yep. spatial intelligence. So like architects, artists, things like that, musical yeah. intelligence, body kinesthetic intelligence. So that would be the athletes, interpersonal intelligence. That would be the um, emotional intelligence you mentioned. And then he's got only one more, actually. It's naturalistic intelligence, huh. which says the ability to recognize, categorize, and draw upon certain features of the environment. So biologists, conservationists, and farmers typically have strong naturalist intelligence. And it would be nice if you had all of those type of intelligences. And maybe there are others too. Maybe there's, um, what would the ability to, um, poetic intelligence, to weave a fabric of stories that people- I think he says that's linguistic. Would that be linguistic? Yeah, he that's says writers, possible. poets, lawyers, and speakers often exhibit high linguistic intelligence. I think it's pretty clear there are different types of intelligence. So no question about that. I mean, this- for years, it's been well known that you, the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere of the brain deal with entirely different things. And it's actually been proven scientifically by separating those two types. Yeah, so absolutely. 
specialization and division of labor is the answer to the question. As long okay. as you're really good at one of those types of intelligence, you can make your way in the world in the four score and seven years that we're all granted. Right, and just and play and play to your strengths, right? If you're naturally good at spatial, then you know you focus there. Yeah, yeah, and figuring out that's the way you should do it is one of those types of intelligence, I guess. It is okay. I'll just do a couple more questions uh, for today, Doug. Um, let's see. Have you read Anthem by Ayn Rand? I haven't. I should. I've heard that it's an excellent little novel. Yeah, it's short and and good and much easier than someone trying to read Atlas Shrugged, I think. So you get the reward a lot faster. Um, okay, this question is, by fomenting reckless wars, climate hysteria, energy destruction, disease panic, and rampant inflation, governments and international organizations seem determined to cause massive problems that will convince people to yield what's left of their liberty to the people who cause the problems. As a remedy, po politics is obviously pointless, better to find ways to improve our personal situation and avoid or profit from the ongoing calamity. He says the file is a great place for like-minded people to find ways like to do this. And Harry's Brown, How I Found Freedom in Unfree World is a terrific book on the topic as well. Uh, do you know of any other good sources for people trying to live fulfilling lives despite concerted efforts to stop them? Yeah, that's the uh, $64 question, of course. Everybody should read Harry's book, how I Found Freedom in a Free World. Uh, free world. It's a great book, actually. Uh, Harry was a great guy, generally speaking. I mean, I, I really liked him uh, a lot, you know, personally. He wasn't just a good thinker. He was just great to hang out with as another person, uh, a real pleasure. So, and one thought that the questioner had to do with politics as a solution and it's absolutely not the solution because the people that go into politics are inevitably people that want to control other people. And I'd much rather hang out with people that want to control physical reality than want to control other people. And those are the type that always go into politics, that want to, one way or another, enforce their will on other people. So, so correct there. Politics is not the answer. Voting is not the answer. What is the answer? I think that's the question. What is the answer? I, I, yeah, I, 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 I know. Yeah, if, if the mind of every human on the planet could be cleansed of the ba bad things that cause people to do bad things, the bad things that cause people to do bad things, I don't know what those might be. Maybe the bad things that are done to them, cause them to act in uh, negative ways. Who knows? It's it's always going to be a problem. Yeah, You've got 8 billion human beings on this planet, and lots and lots of them want to enforce their will on the other people on the planet who don't want that to happen. So what do you do? Yeah, you know, if you think that there are obviously all these outside factors are kind of making people's lives harder and they're kind of hard to avoid completely. But at the same time, it does seem to me, there's a, in a recent episode, you talked about it being hopeless. And I said, and I, th I think you asked me what I thought. And I said, well, it depends upon what you, what it is. Well, like what is hopeless? And I think that the solutions to the state are hopeless. I think that the, you know, the economic path the U S is on is hopeless, but you know, there's the vast majority of your life is still with totally within your control. The decisions you make every day are up to you. You know, you can build something or you can destroy something. You can, you know, have really good relationships with your kids or not. You can, um, you know, you can sit in front of the Netflix all day or you can do something productive. I mean, the vast majority of all choices are still up to us. Yeah. And there are times and places, you know, it seems throughout history where, Camelot arises, and it lasts a little while, then it goes away. I mean, times where there were problems, but generally speaking, good things flourished, like Athens in the 5th century. Things were very good there for a while. Uh, the time that, that, that Gibbon wrote about in his decline and fall of the Roman Empire, where he starts the book talking about in all the history of man, 
uh, this is perhaps the best. So there are periods like that. And then there are other periods where things are absolutely horrible, mm -hmm. just generally speaking. And you're lucky if you can find a hole to hide in where you won't be rooted out and killed. So what's the answer to this problem? Is it an insoluble problem? I mean, if we start a new civilization on a distant planet someplace, will the same problems arise? Hmm. Seems like a problem we can't. The macro problem you can't control though, you know? So I think it's almost like, you know, I mean, if you like, obviously you win the lottery. I, you know, won the lottery and that I grew up, was born in the U S when I was, I mean, it really was great to great advantage for me. But if I hadn't had that great advantage, I think I would like the best answer for me would have been wherever I was born to have an attitude like, well, this is, these are the constraints I have. What can I do with it? What can I do to make this as good as it can be for me? You know, and there are plenty of people that grew up in the U S and the same as me who didn't nothing with it. Right. So no matter where you are, you know, there you are, and you have to do what you can with what you have. It really is that simple. Charity begins at home. What do you think of Panama as a potential relocation country? He says, I know they were terrible during COVID, but most places were. In addition to Panama City, do, do you have any, do you know anything about Boquete toward the Costa Rican border, about midway between the coasts? Seems like there's a burgeoning expat community there. Um, there's some file members there. But what's your opinion of, of Panama and Boquete? I don't think I've been to Boquete. I've been to Panama numerous times, but Panama is actually a pretty good choice. I mean, with all the problems, Costa Rica used to be the used to be the place to go in Central America, but I think Panama is better. It's Panama City is very advanced, very sophisticated. The Panama Canal presents a lot of advantages. The fact that the Americans were there for over a hundred years mean that means that. More Panamanians speak English as a second language than probably any other country in Latin America, in maybe Latin America in general. Panama City is very advanced. It's, I, I think it's a pretty good choice. Okay. Um, how do you feel about the emerging field of anti-aging and life extension technologies? Do you believe these advancements will significantly impact our society and economy in the future? And what investment potential do you see in companies that are pioneering these innovations? Yeah, well, I've been exposed to that and marginally involved in that for a good part of my life. And my interest in it started <clears throat> with a book called Life Extension, A Practical Scientific Approach, written by my friends Dirk Pearson and Sandy Shaw. And it became a huge bestseller back around 1980, uh, where they explain well, exactly what the title of the book is, Life Extension, A Practical Scientific Approach. And of course, the science has advanced by leaps and bounds since they wrote that book. Um, and well, for instance, well, okay, so does any of this stuff work is the question. And I know people that are playing with everything from trying to lengthen their telomeres to playing with stem cells, all kinds of things. It's, um, it's still in the if come see stage, even though people have been working on it seriously for well over 50 years, <clears throat> what proof do we have that current theories of life extension are actually working, adding to your life? Well, Clint Eastwood, perfect example. And um, he got onto the life extension bandwagon 50 years ago because he read also Dirk and Sandy's life extension book. And he's been doing that and other things and he's 93 and about as hale and hearty as a guy of 93 could be, it seems to me. So it can't hurt to try these different things because Clint is trying. It seems to be kind of working for him. And you got people like Ray Kurzweil. I think Ray Kurzweil is about 75 or 80, something in that area. And um, <clears throat> he takes it really seriously, takes about 150 pills per day and does all kinds of therapies. And, but he's a billionaire and he's wired with everybody on the cutting edge of these things. So he not only knows what's going on, but can put the theory into practice because he's got the capital to do it. <clears throat> and he says, you know, every.
singularity, one magic light. Look, I don't know. I don't think anybody, but I'm a believer in the advance of science and technology. But okay, so it's great to extend your life for 50 or 100 years. I'm all for it. Yeah, the hard thing is there's so many things. There's There hasn't been any clear that I've seen any clear single thing that really is the pathway there. It's like a whole, people are trying a whole, like this hodgepodge approach to it. And it's hard to know, you know, it's hard to know which things actually work and which things don't make any difference. You're absolutely right. That's the way I see it too. I mean, first thing is it's important to get lucky being born to the right parents, have good genes and use common sense, diet and exercise and good personal habits. And when you see something that seems to make sense or seems to help you, well, take advantage of it. But listen, we're trapped here on a prison planet. And, you know, even if you have an infinite life and youth, eventually an accident is going to kill you anyway. It's just, they've done studies on these things. It's like being a glass in a restaurant, okay? Even if you're a cherished glass, put up on the shelf, eventually something's going to happen. Oh my God, the shelf falls. Oh, doesn't matter how careful I was with that glass. It broke with all the others. So there's no way out of this conundrum, I'm afraid. Nobody yeah, gets out of it alive. Yeah, I, I think people look, people are too afraid of death too, I think also. And it's like, it's, you know, it's like hidden away in a closet where no one even wants to see, you know, the elders and, you know, no one wants, like, People want to, our current culture is so oriented toward the materialist and the now, you know, and like the, that it doesn't even, that it tries to ignore death rather than, um, I don't actually, I don't think you should be obsessed with death, but I think it's like, it is part of the, part of life and like looking at it as something that shouldn't be thought about or avoided. And at all costs, I think is, I don't get that at all. I don't see anything wrong with death. I, I don't personally. Well, uh, and of course, one thing we haven't, discussed in this area right now is religion. I mean, historically, people had a totally different attitude towards death because they were sure there was an afterlife. But I'm not religious. Our society isn't religious. The people that are religious believe that when you die, either you'll go to heaven, whatever that is, wherever that is, or you'll go to hell and burn in a lake of fire for eternity. That doesn't make any sense. But, but maybe various oriental philosophies are right. And Maybe you're a spiritual entity just inheriting, just inhabiting this body. And death being as traumatic as it is, you forget about it and you are reincarnated. Maybe that happens. I mean, who knows? The fact is, is we don't know anything. Have you ever looked into people into near-death experiences? Um no. Well. I've read some things about this, the tunnel of light and all this type of thing that people say. I, I don't know what to think. Maybe they're hallucinating. I don't know. Have you? Yeah, I've listened to a fair amount. It seems it's just some consistent things that patterns that emerge from it that I think based upon, obviously, I haven't had, I haven't died and I haven't had a near-death experience either, but I think like I can, I can buy into so, so which, which would just implies that this, that when you die, like the Eastern idea that your spirit continues on. I think I, I definitely buy that. I think it's, it makes as much sense as anything else. And of course, people believe that they've had past lives in addition to believing in future lives. And I've talked to these people and actually had some experiences that made me wonder about the validity of that even. And I get back to the Socratic thing is that the only wise man is somebody that knows that he doesn't know anything. Right. I totally agree. I totally agree. Okay. Last question for you, Doug. A few weeks ago, we talked about Danzi de Capajate and you talked a little bit about, you know, basically your perspective on it now, you know, what you would do differently. You wouldn't have a golf course, for instance. And of course, you're not interested in anything like this at your stage of life. But the guy was wondering, just to understand your thinking about this, if you were wanting to do development today, but you're not, for like-minded, liberty-minded folks, and you were doing it again, where would you want to locate it in general terms? And um, how would you envision it this time? Where would you want to locate it? Okay. 
hmm, definitely someplace where you have a reasonable prospect of other people leaving you alone. I mean, that's kind of the number one thing where if you don't defend or damage anybody else, you can just be left alone. So where in the world might that be? Hmm. Well, I wish it was the U.S., or for that matter, Canada, because uh, I liked what those societies used to be, but uh, they're both headed in the wrong direction, so maybe that would be the long, wrong location. I think, actually, I kind of got lucky with Argentina. I was way premature on it, but uh, where can you go where people will leave you alone? That's the number one thing. And then it takes, these things take capital, okay? So you can put together facilities that will attract people where they can have and do the things that they want, make life pleasant. Um, so I'd lo love to see somebody build another estancia and um, maybe build it in a way that um, it just draws you know, like have, instead of building a golf course, you build a great library and that will draw a different type of person. Hmm. I don't know. I, I think if you to... think it out, all the things that you might want, if you have the capital, you put them together in a community. And uh, it's like that movie that Kevin Costner made, if you build it, they will come. There's some truth to that. Hmm. Especially if you're connected with the kind of people that, could be considered desirable, rational, peaceful, thoughtful, libertarian-oriented people. If a few of them move there, a few of their friends might say, gee, this looks like a really nice place. I got some friends that live there. It's almost got to be organic, though. It's almost got to be, you can't like put out a casting call and bring in people from the highways and the byways. I don't know. Another yeah. one of these hard-to-answer questions. Yeah, I think so, too. I mean, the hard, the hard... I was just thinking about this kind of thing a few years ago. The biggest problem with all the pre-planned developments, um, and if you use Capajate as an example, which I think is a beautiful place and it's very pleasant to be there and there's good people there, is that it requires capital from outside to exist. It's not. It doesn't generate capital internally, which basically means in some respect, it's de it constantly demands people who are able to be productive elsewhere for it to survive. And versus a, 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 the way towns normally form, communities normally form, they, they form around productivity. They produce things that can they can export to the elsewhere, and that makes the place more and more valuable, and that allows it to grow organically. That is an excellent point. I mean, just because it's a pleasant place to be doesn't mean that it's sustainable because it's going to need capital from outside unless you are creating the capital there. So, yes... Maybe it has to be organic. Uh, yeah. I think to, to really point. sustain, it has to be. To really sustain. Yeah. In, in fact, you could say, well, maybe living in New York City would be ideal because you have everything you want. You can do something that makes your personal life and that of your friends sustainable, but you're within a, you know, a, a dystopian mess, you know, but it can be pleasant. Yeah, that's true. I mean, maybe it's buying a, I mean, it's hard to say New York now, but if you use that example, maybe it's buying, you know, one of these, I mean, they're commercial real estate, unfortunately, but if you imagine one of these condo towers, um, you know, goes up for sale for cheap, buying one of those and doing a development within one of those buildings that's for your people might actually be more useful than anything else. It might be. Of course, you have to rely on outside water and outside electricity, which might get iffy under the wrong circumstances. Yeah, I wouldn't bet on it, but I mean, I'm just following the thought experiment further. Yeah. Yeah, but it's an interesting thought experiment. It's like Isaac Asimov's foundation book where there was a foundation supposed to be on the other end of the universe. And there was, but there was a second foundation. And it turned out the second foundation was right on Trantor, this dystopian capital city. So you could do it almost anywhere, I suppose. Hmm. But I, I think the thing you have to think about is the productivity of the people, unless it's a retirement community, again, which is relying on capital from outside, or if it's, you know, a resort community, which, you know, those things can exist. But if you want it to really thrive, you have to have a place where families can grow up, 
that parents and kids can be productive and where it's the incentive to stay is greater than the incentive to leave. And economics is the key driver of that. That's right. If you have this ideal platonic community and a kid's born into it, if the kid's going to make his way in the world, he's probably going to have to leave because they don't have industry or the means of production there, if you would. Right. This is why there's been brain drain where we're from in the Midwest, in the U.S. for so long. It's because there just wasn't anything you could possibly do there to grow. You had to leave. Yeah. So instead of an ideal little Camelot-like community, if you want to make your way in the world, you have to go to the big city. Mm -hmm. Yep. Unfortunately. Okay. Well, I think we'll leave it there for today, Doug. Thank you very much. And have a good weekend. We'll be back next week. If you guys have more questions, the best thing to do is uh, go to crisisinvesting.com, subscribe, and we'll get your questions fast tracked to Doug for next week. All right. Well, thank you very much, Doug. Thanks, Matt. It's a pleasure as always.